When we put together the schedule and had this panel arranged, a little bit of time went by and I thought one thing would be really fun is actually to bring up a few of our students and talk a little bit about their interest in the work of church planting or foreign missionary work. Uh, Reverend Bout, or should I say Uncle Rich, um, <clears throat> you know, helpfully cued on the question of, you know, are we discipling and raising up the next generation, even that tension of things that can be caught, things that can be taught, and we want to give that um, a little bit of attention, especially since much of what we're doing here is really focused on raising up the next generation. And so I'm, I'm happy to introduce uh, two young couples. Okay, these are the Chongs and the Verdonks. And they are, well, Jeremy and Ben are seminary students here. And I, I want to ask th this question first. I'm not going to go into a deep dive here, but how many of you grew up in the church? All right, so we've got four covenant kids here. As a pastor and as a dad, that makes me pretty happy. Ladies first, Natalie. They've been warned. They knew all this was coming, so <laughs> a little bit of gentility here. Natalie, tell us where you're, where you're from and how you ended up with this crazy Canadian guy. I know. Um, so just to set the record straight, it's Ecuador. Um, it's a country in Latin America. We speak Spanish. We don't like spicy food, like believe it or not. It's not, not something we're known for. Um, and yeah, how did we end up together? Um, long story short, my mom is a missionary doctor in Ecuador and I got, I knew English and they needed help translating and then there was this church that sent a group of young people and I don't know if I made one too many jokes or it was the whole greeting with a hug and a kiss, um, but then like four years later we got married. <laughs> so yeah, it was, I think it did took us four years to figure us out and I think um, there's a lot of never would I ever that I said that the Lord really humbled me um, and he showed me that his plans are better than mine and, and that's how I'm really here. <laughs> Well said. Jeremy, tell us about some of your evangelistic work in downtown Chicago. What, what do you do and why do you do it? Sure. So um, this is our sixth year, my friends and I, um, going down to the Loop area on Saturdays and um, engaging people on the street, in the park, on the subways with the gospel through conversations, gospel tracks, and open-air preaching. Um, we have been able to train um, young people a lot from Wheaton College and also people from uh, the some Reformed churches in the area. And um, we have now finished, we're entering our second year of having um, a Bible study from that. And we're hoping that if that group can get large enough to plant an OPC church through um, our home church, Covenant in Orland Park. And um, I guess, sorry, we, we do that, so I didn't say why. We, are, we view this as um, just a huge opportunity, a huge mission field right here in our backyard um, and with tons of people. And I think that Chicago is a very special city because it's, we have the city surrounded with very solid churches. Um, and I think that we have a great opportunity to, um, yeah, to, to reach the people with the gospel. I love that language. We have the city surrounded. <laughs> Is that great? <clears throat> and maybe just to add a, a line or two, I've had the privilege of going downtown and doing this uh, with Jeremy and his friends, and I, I was really overwhelmed. I wasn't quite sure what to expect. We met at Wheaton, uh, a handful of students, men and women, young men and women, and we prayed, did a Bible study, sang a little bit together, and then drove downtown. And then they, they kind of post it up in their spots. Jeremy goes down to what, what is called the bean, is that right? This giant mirror, I have no idea what it is or why it's there. It's narcissistic postmodern reflection staring you right in the face, but people go there. And <clears throat> Jeremy stands there with a blow horn, street preaching. And then uh, a couple young men stood there on street corners. A couple young men and young ladies went down into the subway and are handing out tracts to homeless people and crazy people and, and people that look like you. 
as they're walking through uh, on their way. And I was just really, really encouraged. It started raining. That didn't stop them. I thought I was bold. Jeremy's nuts. <laughs> and it was a really fantastically edifying time. I'm going to come back to that. But I want to ask Ben over there a question. Um, ben, what did, I, what did you and Natalie do this summer in Mexico uh, with Uncle Rich? And, and what impact, if any, has that had on your thinking about foreign missions now? Yeah, so uh, we went down with Uncle Rich to Mexico on what was called the uh, Center for um, Cross-Cultural Missions Training. So it was a four-week program. And uh, there were about 20 of us. I think he invited us as chaperones because we were the oldest in the group. Uh, but we had a great time. So we were there. We were, it was kind of crazy. It, it was really crazy. We were traveling all over. And, uh, but we had two weeks of teaching with two different pastors. Uh, just phenomenal, phenomenal uh, teaching. But then also getting to experience life within the community. So Pastor Rich did a phenomenal job with help of other leaders to kind of prearrange that different folks would be living uh, with different people from uh, the church community. And, and uh, the folks, the brothers and sisters uh, in that church community just did a really beautiful job of putting us up, opening up their homes. Um, and then Natalie and I had a great opportunity to go to Guadalajara for the, um, the third and the fourth week. We got to spend some time there with a couple of Presbyterian churches, some crazy stories um, from hanging out with a bunch of homosexual people to hearing about just a remarkable demon-possessed lady who we believe was delivered and brought into the church, but that was a 20-year story in the making. Um, and, and a couple of experiences for Natalie and myself especially of hearing stories with people at this tiny little church in one of the most impoverished communities I've ever seen and just hearing how for them the gospel broke into their lives with the, the power of the Holy Spirit. They were dead in their sins. The father was an alcoholic. Um, the mother was at her wit's end and the whole family was brought to Christ. And then the next morning, going to one of the highest end golf courses in the city with a couple from one of the other churches and hearing not a different story, but hearing the exact same story. And that was a very profound experience for us that, as has been said so well before, the ground before the cross is level. It doesn't matter what your background is. It doesn't matter what social, political, economic category you fit in or whatever. Every single one of us needs the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I think that was one of the most powerful things that stood out to us. In terms of missions, um, just seeing the huge need for the gospel. Uh, Guadalajara, where it is in Mexico, just north of there is what's called, what was it called? Circle or triangle? Circle? Yeah, circle of silence. Yeah. Yeah. Circle of silence. Um, very hostile area with very few missionaries. Um, just kind of a, almost a, a dead zone for the gospel. Just a huge, huge need in Mexico. I've seen that in Ecuador. Um, but then we had a privilege this summer as well of doing an internship in Toronto. And we saw that right outside of our front door. So I think, uh, yeah, being impressed with the huge need uh, for laborers in the harvest field. Natalie, do you want to add anything to that in the sense of anything cultivated in your heart for missions, foreign or domestic? Domestic, And I'll stop there. Okay. Um, yeah, what is foreign for me? Because if we ended up in Ecuador, I'm always like, will that be foreign missions? I don't know. Maybe not. Um, but no, I, I just really wanted to add that I definitely went in thinking that it was, I knew Spanish, I grew up in Ecuador, I knew my Latin people, I even lived in Mexico for four years. So it was really for Ben to learn the culture in Spanish. 
But then when we got there, I remember one of the first talks um, we had Pastor Paul Murphy, and he just said, we've forgotten really the office of the believers because we are all called to share the gospel. And I remember I, just, I was just thinking, well, it's clearly not for Ben. <laughs> it's for me. Uh, and, and it really, I think it gave us tools to just, with whatever gifts God has given us, share the gospel and be faithful wherever we are, the friendships that we have, whatever we have, we can put it at the work uh, to spread um, God's kingdom. And I think it was really kind of like enabling, just not like daunting. We need to go out there, but more like, this is what we all can do, and we can do it in easy ways. Um, so I would say that. It's very encouraging. <clears throat> Has anybody ever told you your husband needs a haircut? Yeah. <laughs> Depend on the circles we're just, in. Just throwing it out there. <laughs> Hannah, I'd like to ask you a question. First of all, you, you may notice what appears to be an extra chair, but, but Hannah, tell us how many chongs are up here on the stage with me? So there are three chongs, one here, <laughs> one here, one here. So, yes. Congratulations. Three. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Hannah, I want to ask then, as a young mom, what do you think about church planting in a place as crazy as downtown Chicago that currently happens to be surrounded by the church? <laughs> yeah, so I would say naturally I'm more of a, a timid person, uh, shy, and God in his providence brought Jeremy and I together. We're very different, but... So my disposition would be one of fear and timidity, to be honest. But I think as I've gone out with the ministry the last few years and seen the work God is doing in Chicago, it's, it's undeniable that there is hope for the city. And there's a real hope in this type of darkness because it is so spiritually dark. You're going down in the subways and seeing people high on drugs and all sorts of promiscuity and real evil. I'm just, it is dark, dark down there, um, dark everywhere, but particularly parts of Chicago, there is a spiritual darkness. And I, what I've seen in young people especially is they're kind of at the end of themselves. They've tried all these things, all these idols in their lives, and they're really in need of the hope of the gospel. There's a, the hope has such a possibility to pierce through that and the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. So I think we both feel like a particular burden and also a hope that God can really wake up the city and use it for his glory. But it will have to be definitely a work of the Lord because by my own nature, I wouldn't say I have it in me, but I do trust in the Lord. Thank you. Very edifying. I want to ask a couple of open questions so anybody can take them. <clears throat> so you've been sitting here now as students listening to a handful of us chronologically enhanced folk. <laughs> means old. or older. And I, I want to roll reverse for a moment here and say, so you've got pastors here, you've got parents here, you've got professors here. Your young folks are interested in foreign missions or church planning. What, what do you think we need to hear from you as a word of challenge, as a word of encouragement? Uh, what, what's the view from the pew to those that are attempting to lead? Great job, guys. <laughs> I think that um, we... Uh, one pastor said we need to get out of the bubble and into the battlefield. And um, when um, Paul was in Caesarea, Agabus, a bunch of others were trying to get him to not go to Jerusalem because of the danger. Um, and I think that you know, he, what he said was, I am willing not only to be bound, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And I think that, you know, in suburbia, we can be uncomfortable with sacrifice, but I think that 
you know, that's what we're called to is sacrifice. And I think that really should be emphasized from the pulpits, you know, and that we should take up our crosses and be willing to renounce all that we have for Christ. Thank you. It's very helpful. Anyone want to add to that? Um, I think practically speaking, um, as somebody who's been interested in going to the mission field for literally a decade now, <clears throat> um, I think I still have a lot more questions than answers. And so in, in some ways, it's kind of difficult sometimes talking with uh, powers that be a little bit here and there and just being like, what do I even do? do? Like, how do I even get to the mission field? And sometimes running up against the answer basically of, I don't really know. Um, so sometimes some, some, some on-ramps, I think we need to maybe develop some of those a little bit, um, just for, for guys who are in the position of desiring to get into the mission field. What does that look like practically? How do we go about doing that? Um, maybe some more clear kind of answers. And then, um, not really sure how to formulate this properly. Um, I know that there are many, uh, how did you put it, chronologically uh, more enhanced. enhanced, chronologically enhanced uh, people uh, who are doing just a phenomenal job of, of missions and evangelism uh, and that is so encouraging and, and wonderful to see. Um, and if I could just kind of, I don't know, give a, a plea for maybe more of that in a sense, um, I think it's very easy in our reform circles that our pastoral ministry, I, I've, I've heard this from pastors before in our circles, of the first thing that gets squeezed out in a busy week is evangelism. and And that's pretty sad. Paul talks on a number of occasions of being an example and setting an example uh, to others. And so in terms of evangelism, discipleship, like Uncle Rich talked about, um, for young guys to be able to see that, see that in action, see that from um, our local pastors on, on kind of on a large swath, the guys around us, see that um, within the seminary, I uh, just see that played out um, a lot, I, I could say, because it is happening. Praise God. So, so great. But if I could just give a little, you know, this whole thing is all about, let's do more of this and let's learn how to do this better. Um, I think that pattern of, of example would, would be a huge benefit for the guys who are kind of coming up behind us. Last question. And if you will try to be <clears throat> brief here. Um, which is not my gift, so I want you to do it. But if someone come up and said, I, I see the Lord working in your life, in your marriage, in your family, and I, and I want to get behind you and push, so tell me what it is that you are really dreaming of doing for the Lord, and I will fund it. What would you say to them? Smart man handing that mic to your wife. Get used to it, brother. <laughs> Yep. Um, well, we could use help um, putting together a war chest um, to get ready for the next few years. Um, yeah, and I think that um, it's, a, it's a really difficult um, thing to do alone. Uh, it's really, I don't think it's even possible for church to be planted in Chicago through um, just us. I mean, it's really, it would need to be a collaborative effort of a lot of people. And I think that, you know, I think the Midwest Presbytery is one of the strongest presbyteries in the world. And I think they're phenomenal, uncompromising URC churches all around here and bold, aggressive church planting, PCA churches, and just who knows what God could do if we pooled resources and yeah, I mean, we have the city surrounded. We are like Gideon's men, and it's time to blow the ram's horn. All right, quit being so bashful, Jeremy. <clears throat> ben? Can you repeat the question again? 
What do you want to do when you grow up? <laughs> I, I don't really know if I can give a straight answer to that. Something that, so I, I already mentioned, um, I personally have been thinking about missions for basically a decade. Uh, Natalie and I getting <coughs> married, we've talked a lot about this. And of course that question of what is foreign, if we stay in more North America, Natalie's the missionary. If we go down to you know Ecuador or something, which we've thought seriously about, I'm the missionary. She's the local. Um, we have thought a lot about going foreign, going home from Natalie kind of thing. Uh, but now, maybe a little more recently, we've been thinking more about uh, um, inner city North American kind of stuff. Maybe a little similar to the to the Chongs. We don't know where God is leading us. So actually, the biggest thing is just to uh, to pray for us, for, yeah. for God's leading and direction. Um, but I think one of the things on our heart, maybe, is to see the reverse happen of what's been happening, where so many people are leaving the city, and that instead, instead of being around the city, we would be in the city. Um, so, so maybe more, more than certainly financial resources, uh, human resources um, that you know if if the Lord were to call us to go into a big city somewhere that more people would say hey let's go join them let's go work with them let's go help them out um, I think that would be one of the biggest dreams yeah it's a privilege to work alongside train and mentor young men like these and get to know their their wives and children on the way let me just take a moment and pray for them Father in heaven, we thank you that you are a God who keeps your covenant promises. And to sit here on a stage alongside four covenant kids, now young men and women, even one young lady with child, uh, we thank you, O oh Lord, for your mercies from generation to generation. And we also thank you that the battle belongs to the Lord. And as you say in your word, you've raised up not simply children, but arrows. <clears throat> Arrows that are striking into the heart of Satan and the kingdom of darkness. Arrows that desire, O oh Lord, to not only uh, strike down that which Satan seeks to do, but to even rescue souls into the kingdom of God. And so I pray, Lord, for the Chong family and just ask your hand of blessing upon them. Bless the child in Hannah's womb. Bless Jeremy's desire to plant a church in inner city Chicago. Bless Verdonks and help them, O oh Lord, to discern your will. And as uh, really in many ways, these two families represent the student body quite well, different denominations, different desires, some clear and resolved, others still seeking your will. Uh, Lord, we just entrust these students to you. They are yours. We are simply their servants. We ask, Lord, that you would continue to nourish their hearts, grow them in holiness, give them a clear vision for your kingdom, and as we've been re reminded, help us to never forget that the battle belongs to the Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, we yield the floor. Well, thank you so much. At this time, I would like to invite our speakers back up to the stage for our panel discussion. I have a ton of notes scribbled on this page. I have dozens of text messages in the uh, the Q and A phone. So we're gonna we're gonna put a big pause button on the Q and A now, or sending us your questions. We've got a lot to go through. We're gonna do our best. But we welcome uh, back to the stage, um, uh, uh, Reverend Vegas and Dr. Menninger, Dr. Hawks and Reverend Bout, and also someone you've not seen yet, uh, Dr. Burke Parsons is with us now. Um, he'll be speaking tonight after the dinner hour, uh, but given some travel arrangements, won't be with us for tomorrow's panel, so we've uh, fast forwarded and brought him up and he's been willing to, to share with us today on the panel. So uh, welcome gentlemen, and we'll just do our best to comb through some of these questions. Um, some of them are addressed to you individually and some are kind of corporately, and I would just encourage, uh, feel free to Take turns at speaking to these things and speaking amongst yourselves as well as we go through some of them. Okay, so I think, oh, and I will also say that a lot of the questions um, are very practical in nature. We've got a lot of pastors and elders in the room. We've got a lot of seminary students, prospective seminary students too. And they've, I think they've been listening as we all have and thinking this is really good stuff. This is awesome. Now how do I do it? I have competing demands in my week. I have uh, other priorities. Where do I put missions? Where do I put evangelism? How do I prioritize that in my ministry? So I guess to sort of set the scene for some of the questions that, um, that we've been given. Um, 
So, Pastor Chad, I'll, I'll start with you, if I may. Um, your comments in, in your opening session, I think, were, were really something that we needed to hear. Undoubtedly, it rattled cages. It probably, um, it probably made us go, ooh, uh, guilty as charged, perhaps. Thank you for challenging us. Thank you for being bold and effective in your speech. Um, why does it seem so easy uh, that the church um, gets distracted from its mission? Yeah, I think, I think there's probably a number of reasons, and I'm not, I'm not sure, I'm, I'm always asked the church questions, what about the church when I'm at a conference, and I think, I'm not sure what's happening with the church. I sometimes have a hard time getting my hands around just the church I pastor, um, let alone all the churches I don't even attend. So I want to be a little careful. I suspect the same things happening in my church that were happening in a lot of churches. There's, um, we live in a, in a nation that's prosperous and comfortable and we get used to a certain kind of life. We have a long time history of, of you know, this idea that my children and grandchildren are gonna be better off than me. Um, we're very focused on those kinds of things. And, and then we're now in a situation where, at least in my state, where people are very alarmed by how things are, how rapidly things are changing, um, how the church seems under assault, and just trying to raise a Christian family. You know, they're, they're putting up laws. Um, like if you want to, Gov Gavin Newsom vetoed this one, I think because he wants to be president, <laughs> but he vetoed this one, but it was passed unanimously that if you could lose custody of your children if you didn't affirm their gender identities. And, um, that sort of thing is, it gets people's attention and understandably so. I, I think there's these comforts that we sort of want to pass to our children that distract us. I think there are um, the kind of assaults that we're dealing with from our own state um, and the future that, that are sometimes distracting us. Understandably, who doesn't want their children to do well and who doesn't, and, and who wants to live in a place where Essentially, you're being assaulted for raising your children in a godly way. So, so those, those kinds of external um, cultural pressures, if you will. But I think the fact is most of us are, um, we're not pursuing Christ in such a way, keeping our eyes on heaven in such a way um, that, that we keep ourselves from being continually distracted by, if you will, earthly concerns. Um, I think that's happening to all of us. So I don't think it would matter how good the cultural situation was um, or how bad it was. The fact is we so often have our eyes down here uh, rather than on Christ who's seated in heaven. And, and so we lose sight of, of what Christ wants for his church and for his people. Yeah, I mean, I could go on about that, but I, th I think that's the, the single biggest issue. Thank you very much. Um, I did just receive a text, so this is sort of a public service announcement. Evidently, it's hard to hear us. So if we hold our microphones closer to our faces, is that better? Okay. Everyone's nodding yes, so we will do that from now on. Okay. Um, Dr. Miniger, um, a question for you. How does our union with the resurrected Christ help shape a sense of call to serve him, even lay down our lives for him? How does it not do that, I guess? That's a, obviously, it couldn't be a seminarian that put that one in there, or, um, I mean, so the, so the doctrine of union with Christ are being bonded to, united to, having a vital connection to Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit, right, um, is central to everything that Paul writes in terms of applied soteriology, what, what Christ means to us, how he comes uh, to be ours, how we come to be his, and then live in him. Um, but I think that, um, what was the second part of it? How does the doctrine of union with Christ specifically apply to? Our sense of call to serve him, even lay down our lives. For yeah. Him. Well, I mean, you could just look at the end of 1 Corinthians 6. Um, you're not your own. You're bought with a price. 
Therefore, glorify God with your bodies, right? Now, Paul there is most immediately talking about sexual purity, but it expands to everything, right? A servant is not greater than his master, and so Christ came not to be served, but to serve, and all of that then, what he has, if we're adequately impressed by, or in other words, it's impressed upon us, the radical thing and the, and the life-altering thing that Jesus Christ has done for us, and that will become replicated in us over time through the power of the Holy Spirit. So dwelling on Christ and the magnitude of his work, appreciating it, being grateful for it, should spur us on to service and Christ-likeness. Thank you. Dr. Hawks, this one for you. Um, you know, we do have a number of seminary students in the crowd today and, and prospective students, as well as churches who uh, might be looking at the prospect of planting other churches. Um, so how would a person, um, considering the ministry, right, uh, discern if they might be called to the work of church planning specifically? Thank you. <clears throat> Excellent question. Um, <clears throat> often people think that a uh, church planter is um, uh, something other than a pastor, uh, but a church planter is just a pastor, and a, and a certain kind of pastor uh, with some particular gifts, but 95% of, uh, of the work is the same thing. You're pastoring to plant a church. So it's not that unique. If you have the gifts to be a pastor, you likely have the gifts to plant a church. It's all just being a faithful pastor at its heart. Uh, probably one small category that would be a little bit different, and that is uh, the ability to start things from, from the very beginning. And so one of the things we'll often look at in my denomination, the ARP, under leadership abilities, we have five or six things we look at, and one of those is the ability, sort of entrepreneurial organizational gifts to start new things. And so one of the things you can do is look at your background, your history, and ask yourself the question, have I ever started things? Do I enjoy starting things? Has God built me to start things? I was talking to our son, who's a church planter, and he was uh, sort of evaluating himself, and he said, well, I'm really not much of a leader. And I said, are you kidding? Mm -hmm. uh, I said, in high school, this is in North Carolina, in Charlotte, and I said, you started a ski club, and 30 people joined it, and you were taking trips skiing. He goes, I was just having fun. I said, you started from scratch, uh, a new organization, and 30 people joined you. That's a pretty good track record right there. So you look for those kinds of things in your, in your sort of your tendency and in your ability set. Thank you, Dr. Hawks. Dr. Parsons, um, uh, Reverend Bout hinted uh, in his message about um, things that can, can plague uh, our young people. And, and um, you're, you're a father uh, of teenagers, as I understand. And I'm curious, um, what do you see as some of the greatest challenges, because you're also a pastor, of um, before our young people today? And maybe a follow-up question to that is, how can we as parents and church leaders uh, engage with this? trying to pinpoint the question, forgive me, what are the greatest problems they're facing? Or yeah, our young people, what are, they, what are they dealing with that you see? What are this, their, some of their struggles, some of their concerns? And then also, as church leaders and pastors, how can we engage this? Well, let's, uh, that's a great question, a couple questions. Let's, let's focus it, it on the subject at hand, I think would be helpful. Um, I think one of the greatest challenges that uh, we're all facing, but teenagers in particular, uh, because they're right in the midst of all the turbulence of everything that's going on socioculturally, and that is that the greatest problem in our day among young people, uh, and, and really one of the greatest sins, is to hurt someone's feelings. And so they're being taught, and when we grew up, our parents taught us, our mothers would teach us, if you don't have anything nice to say, then don't say anything at all, right? But we also understood that sometimes certain things needed to be said. Even certain things that were hard, certain things that, that would upset people or even hurt feelings. Well, today, the greatest sin among, you know, our culture is just hurting anyone's feelings. And so here we are trying to teach our young people to stand up for Christ, to preach the gospel, to have a witness for Christ, but then they're told by the culture, well, don't tell anyone anything that would in any way hurt their feelings. And when you preach the gospel, you're going to hurt people's feelings. 
because you have to tell them that they're sinners. And most people don't think they're sinners. They think they're good. God's good. They're good. They're okay. God's okay. God created them. Why wouldn't he love them? And so what we have to do is we have to help our young people to have both humility, meekness, gentleness, and courage. Courage to lovingly and carefully and patiently, but also speak the truth. Speak the reality of sin and God's wrath and condemnation and helping their friends, helping their classmates understand that they have a dire need. And so we have to teach them that they're going to be disliked. And none of us likes to be disliked. I mean, we all want to be liked. Now, anyone who says, I don't care what anyone thinks about me, I don't care if anyone likes me, they're just lying. We all want people to like us. But we as Christians have to be willing to be hated for the sake of Christ. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Reverend Bout, I have one here um, sent from one of our guests. And it says here that uh, it seems that, we're, we're looking at home missions at this point, it seems that at this time in home missions, there may be two prominent classes of people. Uh, those that are pagans without a background in the faith, and those who um, they have maybe been burned by the church um, in some way, or those that have, been, that have wrong theological beliefs, uh, paraded as Christian beliefs, um, uh, per, you know, can you think of prosperity gospel, legalism, things like that? Um, as far as the second group, what are some practical steps for dismantling false beliefs uh, about Christ and, and, the, and the faith without giving them ground to reject Christ outright? In Mexico and in the United States and Canada, probably the biggest theological issue that we've had to deal with in this generation is health and wealth. Uh, doctrine of the Holy Spirit. We haven't seen it as much in our churches, but it's reality in most evangelical churches. I think a lot of people have been severely damaged because of it. And I don't think, as Reformed believers, we're always aware of that because that's not, they're not part of our circles. Um, Mexico, this was huge. Probably the, the biggest um, barrier for me as a missionary was the extreme charismatic church. They were not Trinitarian. Uh, yeah, just about on every level, we could not have fellowship with them. Very, very serious deviations. Different from the old Pentecostal church. So my eyes were open just to some of the abuses and some of the things that were going on. There was one group, especially Brazilian uh, uh, charismatics, that would come in and they would convince people to give to the church even sell their house, uh, give all the money to the church, then walk away with it or misuse the funds. So one of the things you were talking about, Tom, so important, uh, you know, about being committed as a church to be transparent in the way we receive funds. So I understand that, you know, that, that damage that's been done. A lot of people are hurting. And we ha I think we have to have a listening ear and to understand and then to correct some of their you know, misconceptions of the church. And a lot of them are, are rightly founded. Um, so, yeah, to be understanding of that and then to give them the proper presentation of who Jesus is and what the church is, then is the, the next step. Excellent. Thank you, Pastor. Um, now here's one just I'll lob up and, and, and you guys can take a swing at it however you like. Um, what can we do practically as normal church members? whatever, normal church members, what might qualify us as normal, but uh, what can we do as parishioners, right, as, as the, uh, um, as in, to encourage other church members, our leaders, and ourselves um, to take up mission work or at least talk about the condition of the unsaved more? They offer a comment at the end that says, I feel that in our richly blessed churches, we forget the lost so quickly. I, I mentioned a few things in the sermon that you can be doing. One of those things would be, and I would tell you to start at home um, with your own children and family worship, praying for your lost neighbors by name or coworkers or friends, family members, um, reaching out to them, 
letting your children see you go through the bumps and bruises of trying to talk to your neighbors about Christ and how that affects the relationships. There's difficult. It can be difficult. It can be uncomfortable because, like, I live next to these people, and now they're really not happy with me. And I'm not saying that, you know, you, you run over and knock on the door and say, watch children, you're going to hell. And so, you know, they, why, why don't they like us? So the, um, but I, I do think there are, are probably better ways to go about it than starting off that way, but praying for them, loving them, caring for them, sharing the gospel with them, letting your children see that. Um, is one place you can start praying for unreached people groups, praying for missionaries who are in the field. Um, those are things you can do in your family worship. Mm -hmm. I think you can then bring those things into the church when you have your prayer meetings, which I, I'm assuming you have, and begin to pray for those things there. Um, and you can encourage your pastors. If, if you don't hear that happening in, in the preaching enough, encourage them. I don't, I don't mean come up and accuse them. Um, I mean encourage them, uh, ask them to, to think about addressing that more. I, uh, there have been things my folks have brought to the table to me and I haven't thought about addressing as regularly as I should. Hey, Pastor, you, you haven't addressed pornography and it's a major problem. Oh yeah, I mean, you know, I got married before there was an internet, right? So um, I didn't even think about that dr dramatically. It never has been a problem for me by God's grace and a lot of providential circumstances I'm thankful for. So it just sort of slipped my mind. It's not that I haven't dealt with members who've had the problem. I just didn't think about what a predominant problem was. So people brought me, I, I probably should address that. And so I do think that when it comes to missions or more local evangelism, coming to your pastors and reminding them, mm -hmm. encouraging them, I think can be very helpful. Yeah, thanks. Dr. Talk. I agree with everything Chad said. I would probably just add to it, volunteer. Yeah. So if you're a member of the church, uh, volunteer for missions teams, volunteer for local outreach. Uh, you know, sort of let your outreach heart infect the others around you by your activity. And so it's less uh, telling the leadership what they need to do is just jumping right in and getting involved with outreach. It really can become infectious to see that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And volunteering to help disseminate information, right? So. Is there a, a point person that um, gathers and helps um, broadcast or distribute or post physically or electronically information about missionaries, information about home missionaries? You know, is there a point person at your church that does that? If there is, can you help them or can there be a committee or whatever? Ask your pastor or your session or consistory, you know, would it be okay if I did this or, you know, there's plenty of things that can be done to increase visibility of the topic of missions. Start a prayer meeting about it. Some very simple, practical things. If I could, I think this is a very important question. I think it's, it's really kind of getting to the, the real root of, of the problem in the church. Um, and I'll say, I think in many ways it has it has been a long-standing problem in the church. And I think in many ways it, 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 it goes way back and it kind of begins even in the seminary. Uh, one of the reasons I'm so grateful for this seminary and this Center of Missions and Evangelism is they're, they're, they're creating this center and focusing the attention of its students on really what we're about. It's not very common in most seminaries. And I think the, the reason I say it begins in the seminary is that we look at the whole subject of missions as sort of, that's just something that some people do, rather than it being part of the fabric, part of the warp and woof of the entire curriculum. If missiology is not woven through the curriculum and the courses, if it is not at the heart of our theology, we have to understand, missiology is theology. Ecclesiology is theology. Mm -hmm. And the Great Commission is not just something we talk about once in a while, and many seminaries treat it like that. And so it's only, it's only until the seminaries really begin to help their students understand the, the, the foundational importance of missiology and all that that means, that pastors will begin to preach it as a part of their entire message. It won't just be something relegated to a missions conference or festival or once a year. It'll be a part of their conversation. It'll be a part of their message. It'll be a part of their preaching. 
And, and, and so church planting and missions and evangelism and, 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 and conversations about Christ, like Chad said, it begins with ourselves, it begins in the home, and then it just bleeds out into our conversations with colleagues and friends. And so I think the two go together. And I think it's, it's only when we as pastors understand that, that it will be something that will bleed out into everything we're talking about. Not every sermon, if you will, but it's still part of the fabric of every sermon. Sure, you are absolutely. Yeah, thank you very much. Actually, I'm going to, um, if you can just bear with me, um, I'm going to bounce to another question. I um, didn't have that one up. Okay, uh, this is for everybody again. Uh, take it as you will. Whoever would like to start, feel free. Uh, this is quite interesting. Um, while we distinguish what it means to be reformed in our church planting endeavors, how then do we partner with other churches and denominations in our community or city who are not reformed but love the word of God, the church, prayer, and the lost? Another way of putting it might be, if to be reformed is to be confessional, and to be confessional is to be Catholic, then how should we approach mission works? Holding on to our reformed distinctives but at the same time, being Catholic with our relationship with other churches, denominations, for the sake of the gospel. In other words, how can we work together with other churches? Other... I think that this is something that we, as a church, oftentimes have not thought enough about. Uh, one of the, uh, I believe, the, the greatest untapped resource in the church today is 18 to 25-year-olds. A lot of times in our circles, we have not put them to work. We, we have not had jobs for them to do within the church. And I think by being involved carefully with other organizations, it is possible to partner in a profitable way for the church. I think explaining to our young people that there are going to be differences, um, but then our strengths to bring those strengths to that table and for our young people to be openly, enthusiastically serving as Reformed believers in evangelical organizations can have a huge blessing, a huge blessing. There's a lot that could be said on this question. It, it's a brilliantly written question because it's meant to trap us. And so it's got to be from one of the brilliant students here at the school, uh, the way he reasons and then asks this question, well, why wouldn't we? And, and I think, you know, books could be written on this, and, and books have been written on this very subject. And, and the difficulty is, is that in, in one sense, we don't, we don't actually have to. That is to say, we don't actually have to work with other churches or denominations in order to do missions and evangelism and see the Great Commission fulfilled. I think the question is, can we and should we? And maybe that is the direct question. Can we and should we? Well, in one sense, we already do. It's sort of like that bumper sticker that we see from time to time. May, they may have outlawed it in Indiana and Illinois, but in Florida, it is that bumper sticker that says coexist. You know, it's got all the different symbols and signs from the different religions. You know that one? And uh, I always see that and say, well, we do coexist. We're all here existing as human beings, uh, and to one degree or another, we are living together. Uh, I wouldn't say necessarily in harmony, but we are existing together. So the reality of it is, is that I can have a whole, I can have a great deal of respect for brothers in different denominations, so long as I know what they believe, and if they have a confessional standard, then I know what they believe. That's what's great about working with confessing Baptists or confessing Lutherans, is that we know what they believe, we know where we differ, and so if we know that there's someone who is Lutheran who is doing evangelism, we can support the work to the degree that we can. But if they're Reformed or Presbyterian, depending on what ilk and how conservative or less conservative or progressive, we're going we're gonna to want to steer them away from those churches or towards those churches. But what we, what we have, of course, is the gospel. And what we have is the gospel, and what we have are the foundational truths of the Word of God. But there, there is... There is, in our Catholicity, there is an understanding that people will hear the gospel, that we want to teach them the doctrines of our holy religion. 
We want to direct them to good, faithful churches that are rightly administering the ordinary means of grace, rightly and consistently carrying out church discipline and caring for the souls of her people. And so if we can find that, well, we can be grateful for that. When we find that, we can be grateful for where we see that. What we don't want to do is make the mistake that some have made, and I'm not going to quote this person because I want to protect the guilty. What we don't want to do is make the mistake of saying, well, that means that we necessarily need them that we necessarily need this group or that group, and I'm intentionally not mentioning particular groups. Well, we want people to know the truth. We want people to know the truth that we affirm, and we believe that those truths are the summaries of the biblical truth that we believe, and that's what we want people to come to. So we can appreciate and respect. That doesn't mean we necessarily need or have to work with those with whom we differ at every level. I, I think there are some things we can do to, you know, that we can be co-belligerent on that are, um, you know, standing up, you know, standing up for the right to life or something. Um, there, are, there are things that, you know, so you start going from this kind of base thing like, hey, you, you believe that a man is a man and a woman is a woman? So do I. <laughs> In this way, we're on the same team. But there are other things as you rise up that, that become more difficult. And you, I was laughing because you're asking how people work together in different denominations. I'm a man who was a um, Calvinistic dispensationalist Baptist who was planting a church with a three forms of unity Dutch boy named Jason Faber. And we were stupid, young, evangelical guys that thought we could do the same thing together. Jason sort of knew um, that we couldn't. So I, I was the senior pastor. He became the associate pastor after the church grew enough. And um, people would ask him, how do, how do you endure this with this guy? Right? And he would just say, I'm just, I'm just waiting him out. Right? <laughs> I'm going to be patiently bringing him along. He's expositing the word. He'll get where I am. He was right. So <laughs> I, I did. And he, was, he was maybe unwise in doing it. I wouldn't recommend it to other people. But, but by God's grace, um, I, I did come along, and, and so it's kind of funny for me because I've been in both of these worlds, um, and so we've thought, well, how do we encourage men along rather than looking down? And we, we obviously, like William Carey talks about in his in, inquiry of, into obligations, he talks about the fact that, you know, the Reformed Baptist guys, they, they didn't call them that at the time, but what we call Reformed Baptists today, that, you know, as, if we're a missionary church planning team, we need to be aligned doctrinally. We can't really have a group of folks on this team who are doctrinally in very different places because we can't plant a church together that way. And so he talks about that. I think, I think that's right at that level, um, even though my own situation was confusing, and, but the Lord worked it out. Um, I think that's the right way to think about it. But there are things we can do. So at, in my own church, you know, we, we have prayer meetings every Sunday evening, and we once a month pray for another ministry in our city, another church and a pastor. We bring the pastor in, ask him what things we can pray for for him and his family and his church, and we do that. Um, we pray for the other churches in our city in our uh, pastoral prayer time. Uh, we have a pastor's fellowship where we invite all these pastors who are fairly like-minded, um, and we give them free books, and we bring in speakers, and we feed them, and they come, and we're influencing them in a particular direction. They're reading the books that we're choosing, <laughs> right? And so I think there are things we can do to show a kind of Catholicity, but there's a point at which um, you have to be on the same page, doctrinally, confessionally, to go forward in ministry, yeah. so. Yeah, thank you. I think um, I would like to Rebooting. Are we back? Okay. Sorry about that. Um, one last question for our panel before we break for dinner. And this sort of, again, it, it gets into the practical application of a lot of what we're talking about. And I really want to ask it because I think it's on the mind of a lot of pastors. So in our circles, especially in this area, in Reformed and Presbyterian congregations, it's often kind of a one-man one, one shop, right? 
The pastor is preaching, he's teaching, he's visiting, he's doing all these different things. And so um, I want to ask this one, from the perspective of a pastor now, uh, how do we devote adequate attention to missions and evangelism when there's hardly enough time and energy to prepare weekly sermons and care for your flock, but also being there for your family? So maybe the church doesn't have a pastor of outreach and a pastor of this thing is dying. Maybe, um, thanks Marcus. Maybe the pastor doesn't have a staff and he's doing this sort of on his own. He may have elders. Uh, how would you recommend he structure his week? I'm not sure about structuring the week, but uh, philosophically, as has been said, uh, it's necessary if you're a faithful Reformed pastor to have a vision for missions and evangelism and church planting. It's, mm-hmm. It is our calling. And so I think it's just that it's a matter of thinking about that persistently, everything you do. We had a core team meeting a couple of weeks ago, and I was our small core group, and so I'm a one-man show. Well, my wife's in there with me, so two of us at that. Um, and one of the, and I was presenting the uh, vision for the church and included missions and said, we want to raise up people from this city and send out all over the world as missionaries. That's part of why we're here. And one of the guys said, I just totally disagree with that. We need to focus here. Our mission is here. We shouldn't think about the rest of the world. And I listened to him for a little while, and in the midst of the meeting, I said, I hope after you've been with us for a couple of years, two years from now, you'll stand up in front of this group and apologize for what you just said. That because if we're not doing missions, we're not being Christians. When Jesus gave us the Great Commission, when uh, he, he in, in Acts 1-8, when he said to be uh, witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and other most parts of the earth, he didn't say, well, just at the walls of Jerusalem, you'll stop your witness. <laughs> So for us to be faithful Christians here with what we're doing, we have to constantly have our eyes on the horizon and be thinking about missions in the the rest of the world in order to faithfully serve here. And we can't just look at our feet or just look at the horizons. We have to keep those both in perspective and in our sight at all times. So I do think it's it's just a question of vision. And so it's not not a question of um, how do I find time for it. it. It's a part of everything that we have to be doing. Yeah, yeah. These uh, brothers have a lot more experience than I do, but I I just want to say, um, I would start by saying, how can it be a part of what I'm already doing, right? How can I get double use out of something I'm already doing as well? Um, So how can it be part of what I'm already doing? Am I praying about it from the pulpit? Am I teaching my people to pray about missions and outreach by praying about it from the pulpit, right? Uh, Do I have a plan for that? Do I have some sort of form of organization? Do I have information that I need to do that, right? About missionaries, about church planters, about other things, uh, about lost people connected to our church. Um, So how can I filter that in? Am I preaching about it? Um, Is it a portion of my sermon most times? Or in other words, it's a part of the diet. Every sermon is different. And I mean, I would be the first one to say your sermon should be textual, right? but all the texts also relate to one another. And so in the broad scope of things, I'm, I want to have, am I teaching my people to think biblically, theologically? Well, that's a whole other topic that we're not directly talking about in this, but I want to be teaching them that, right? That's a, a, another thing. Am I teaching them to think theologically? Am I think, teaching them to think missiologically? So where do my sermons tend to go when I teach? What about in our existing teaching opportunities, right? Sunday school, whatever's happening. Where is uh, the focus there as a, at least a portion of what I'm doing? Um, and I also just want to say this, and I would like to, I, I was just thinking about this already before the question was asked. I would really like it if our churches would challenge themselves about the one minister model. Discipleship is more time intensive than it used to be. Because um, it used to be that habit and custom would bring people to church, and the monolithic nature of the culture would impress upon them how to live. And now you look at young parents, they don't know what to do. I don't know, always know why, but I mean, because even if they're coming from good families, or whatever, but they're just, they seem to be lost. There's not a template that is clear to them about how to parent, culturally speaking. 
So they have to be taught in a much more time-intensive way than often used to be the case. And the kids themselves are not growing up in a context culturally in which there's a clear cookie-cutter thing that you do, right? Which it has its limitations, but it has its benefits in terms of some basic disciplines in life, character issues, right? So discipleship is more intensive than it used to be. And the one-man show is less adequate than it used to be. So churches need to think about if, you know, if, um, and one other thing, I was struck when the brothers were different brothers were talking and even in conversations last night, people are gifted differently by degree, right? Ministers are di- gifted differently by degree. I'm a professor for a reason, right? Because I'm at one point on the spectrum. That, now, I, I'm obligated to be outreaching in my heart and in my teaching and to teach my students to be outreaching. And I also have an outreach component in my own life, in my neighborhood, and teaching my children to do that. There's all kinds of, but by degree, I'm not a church planter as much, not as well suited to that, right? Do you have a vision for the differences, how different ministers are gifted, and that's why we need teams of ministers, right? How can we do that? Um, our pastors can't counsel all of the needs these days. So maybe we should have regional counselors in our presbyteries. We have regional home missionary in the OPC's presbytery of the Midwest, right? And which is great. That's another thing. But um, we need to push ourselves to be thinking about the time-intensive, human resources-intensive nature of this work and not just be content with, we have a pastor, and boy, having another pastor would be really expensive, right? There's just so many, so many needs.